Um, Chris, when you look at the landscape, maybe just not, not, not just in investment management, what are a few sort of themes, topics that you expect come up in the next year or so based on the startups you work with, uh, technologies you see, what would you point out for people to watch for in that space? I think on the tool side of things, uh, the, the, you know, Gareth, what you mentioned about commoditization is 100% true. Uh, I, I think that we are going to have as many models, essentially, as we're able to, as, as fast as sort of compute gets out there in, in ever greater quantities. And so you'll have more refined models. But, you know, you know Peng, you noted that, um, you know, a model trained with better data can be can be better than just a, a larger model. Uh, and so you're going to have a whole bunch of really specific models, dedicated to specific use cases. Uh, I don't think this is like a, a revelatory idea, but uh, right now it's like, this, this splashy, exciting thing, but then it's going to get into the nitty gritty of like, okay, we've got to build a model that is very specific to the reinsurance industry. We've got to build a model that's very specific to uh, just the investment management. We've got to build a model that's very specific to this. And you're going to have, uh, that's when also quantitative pieces, I think, are going to start coming in. We started to see some startups that are building quantitative sort of aware models. Uh, and once those start integrating into the larger models where you're able to take quantitative data as well as traditional like LLM style like outputs, uh, that's when it'll get really exciting. But once again, it's all gonna be about the data. And this is why I, I'm kind of worried, frankly, about the winner takes all piece here uh, because the combination of massive, massive compute that's required as well as very specific and, and oftentimes they want to be proprietary data uh, that could be involved in these things could mean that any large player, right? And I think about Microsoft and the amount of enterprise data that Microsoft has or Google or Apple, the amount of um, uh, sort of consumer level data that they have, they could build a model both with their compute power as well as with their proprietary data that is going to be orders of magnitude more powerful than, than something somebody could build like off of the street just because they're not going to have those years or in some cases decades of insights. Uh, so I think that the large players are going to build a lot of like very specific ones that are tuned to them and then it's going to be up to frankly the startup community I think to build models that have any chance of competing with those by pulling in really unique data sets or university based or government based or something like that. Well, maybe that's the to counter in some to some degree that where you could you could say that for specific you know if JP Morgan sits on proprietary research database doesn't matter what Microsoft do you you, you wouldn't have that ability you can have a smaller model but, but Microsoft can see across every industry right but if you think about like depending on how much callback right Microsoft mm. does with Office right and especially since it all went online which companies like write documents in what ways most often when where how. Like yeah. they have the visibility across industries that is bananas. Big, big question to to watch for. And uh, uh, with a few minutes left, uh, turning to uh, Judy Garrett Pank, like, um, if you look forward and uh, uh, sort of over the next year in terms of things you might deploy, look at um, uh, anything particularly on your mind, so big hopes on oh this technology, this technique may may make a difference. Yeah, we'll definitely closely follow uh, on the development of our LLM. Uh, ChatGPT of uh, GPT 4.0 already showed a lot more improvement, material improvement versus the previous versions. And Time GPT uh, also just came out, although it's uh, very in a very early stage and nascent stage. You mean Time GPT, right? Time yeah. GPT. That's the first foundational uh, uh, GPT model uh, came out to predict anything in time series space, which is uh, what Ken also pointed out. So we're definitely uh, watching closely and also being hands-on in those space, not just uh, not just as an audience, but also the practitioners. Yeah, well, just just an observation. Uh, when one of the last big moments like this was in in New York City, when uh, Gary Kasparov, the the famous chess grandmaster, was defeated by IBM's D Deep Blue. You know that. Uh, that amazing story. That was 97, so it's 25 years plus uh, here in the city where, where that occurred. And the funny thing was, there's many interesting things about that, but uh, one of the interesting things was that immediately after that defeat, it was assumed that machines would beat all humans all the time, everywhere, under all circumstances. But actually, it took almost 20 years until it was the case that machines could beat all humans. In that 20-year period, 
between when Kasparov lost to Deep Blue and when Deep Mind uh, started to tackle chess, that that 18 year period, the best technology for that problem was was best machine and best human for that 18 year period. So my intuition tells me it's not going to be next year that AI is able to do everything that everyone does in investment management. It's definitely going to, it's definitely a revolution. Uh, and a lot of things are going to happen very quickly, but it, but there is a strong role for very good, uh, high capability, high expertise human beings in, in this industry. It's at least the hope that I have. Human, human hope. As a former chess player, I can actually tell you how fascinating it was to look in 2018 when chess kind of got solved. But it was by doing billions of simulations playing against itself without any guidance except for the key rules, which was quite an interesting thing. We have, um, uh, uh, we have one minute left, so just Pank, maybe um, one other thought from you on the sort of forward-looking basis. Yeah, I agree. Like large language models is not the answer to everything. I think very soon we'll find very specific use cases for not just large language models, but you know the technology that underlies it, which are the transformers. You know that. It's good at, you know, and I do think that in a few years' time, you know, we'll talk about things like large language models, transformers, and apply them in the same way as we apply Black Scholes models to option pricing, apply mean variance optimization to portfolio management, you know. So if we talk about specific specific problem, we'll automatically say, okay, well, I'll use transformers to do that, you know. Now to get there, it may take a little bit of time, but I'm sure we'll get there, and it will be as prevalent as those tools, um, you know, in terms of finance application. And I guess to, to wrap it up, I would refer to what Lama 2 told me when I asked for a bit of a geeky joke to close. You know, you know why, why did the large language model break up with the dictionary? Because it found the dictionary too definitive and not creative enough. So on that creativity and human note, uh, let's all enjoy the innovations in this space. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.